All right, we are now live. So everyone should start joining us. You can see everyone slowly popping up. I'll give it a few minutes. All right, okay, now I see everyone. For a while, it was really slow. Um, I'm gonna get started just so I can give you as much time as possible, Dave. Um, most people have already heard my spiel anyways. <laughs> so hello, everyone. We are going to get started. Thank you all for tuning into Introducing Shore Zones, Their Ecology and Management. My name is Camille Marcotte, and I'm the Water and Ecology Educator with CCE Onondaga. I work as part of the Skinny Atlas Lake Education Program, which is funded by the City of Syracuse to provide education to help protect the water quality of Skinny Atlas Lake. I'm just going to go over some quick logistical items and then I'll turn it over to our presenter for the evening. Um, this is our first program in our Shorelines Matter, an educational series about Skinny Atlas Lake shoreline protection and restoration. We are working hard to plan the remaining programs in this series and we'll share details as soon as possible. This series is a collaborative effort, and so I want to thank the Skinny Atlas Lake Association and Go Native Perennials for their support and assistance in planning the series. We are using Zoom in webinar mode, so you're all muted right now just to reduce any background noise. If at the end you'd like to ask a question using the mic or audio, you can use the raise hand button at the bottom of the screen and I can unmute you. It is very small, so if you have pressed that button and I don't see you, just type something quickly into the chat and I'll um, unmute you. We are going to wait until the end to answer any questions, but feel free to type questions throughout the webinar into the chat and Q&A sections. If you use the Q&A function, you can ask questions anonymously if that's more comfortable for you. And I will be monitoring both of those for when we get to the question and answer portion. This program is being recorded and it will be available to watch on our YouTube channel. The link to the video will be shared in a follow-up email along with an evaluation and any resources. I will post the link to the program evaluation in the chat. Please take a few minutes to fill it out after the program. If you run into any technical issues throughout, please either email me, I'll put my email in the chat, or message me in the chat and I will do my best to respond and help you troubleshoot. Um, but enough from me, I will now introduce our speaker, Dr. Dave Strayer. Dave is a freshwater ecologist with the Cary Institute of Ecosystem Studies, whose research focused on measuring the long-term effects of zebra mussels on the Hudson River ecosystem and understanding the roles of suspension feeding animals and ecosystems. Dave has also worked on broader issues in freshwater conservation ecology and invasion biology. So thank you so much, Dave, for being here and I will um, let you take it away. Thank you, Camille. Uh, can you see my slides? Yeah, looks great. Okay. Uh, thanks for the invitation. And uh, I'm looking forward to talking with you a little bit tonight about, uh, about shorelines and their management. So this is what I want to try to cover tonight. I want to talk a little bit about why the shore zone is so important, both to ecology and to people. I'm going to review briefly the typical human impacts on shore zones. Uh, the part I'm most interested in, maybe you too, uh, are how, how can we improve the ecological performance of managed shore zones while retaining uh, the, the human use that we want to retain? And then I'll close by giving you a link to some further information if you want more detail than I can provide in this little talk tonight. So I, I need to acknowledge right off the, the what's called the Hudson River Sustainable Shorelines Project. Uh, this is a group I worked with for, oh, I don't know, 10 or 15 years. Um, in the, uh, it must have been about 15 or 20 years ago, the folks at the Hudson River National Estuarine Research Reserve realized that we were going to start seeing a lot of pressure to develop and redevelop Hudson River shorelines. This is partly because people were drawn back to the river when water quality got better partly because a lot of the shore defenses along the river, bulkheads and so forth, were starting to deteriorate, needed to be repaired. And then partly because the Hudson's at sea level and we were ex ex anticipating sea level rise. Uh, so the Herner, the Hudson River National Estuarine Research Reserve, 
folks put together this team to see how we, to see if we could figure out how to improve the ecological functioning of Hudson River shorelines while maintaining essential human uses. And one of the things I really liked about this team, being a part of this team, is it included so many different kinds of people. We had uh, managers, we had municipal officials, we had uh, uh, marine engineers, ecologists, landscape architects, uh, we had uh, bankers, all kinds of people who were interested in uh, in the ecology use development of of, uh, of, of shore zones. And, uh, and, and a whole bunch of the information we developed is available on the Herner website, and I've given you uh, the, the link here. I, Camille, I think, is going to share my slides with you later, so all this stuff will be available to you, to you later if you're interested. So uh, let me explain first what I mean by the shore zone, and this is something that's actually not very easy to define precisely. There's a sort of semi-technical definition in the upper right of the slide here. Basically, the shore zone is the, the part of the land that's strongly influenced by the water and the part of the water that's strongly influenced by the land. And so this would include things like the shoreline itself, uh, shallow waters, the plant beds or near shore areas that lie offshore, and then the upland areas or the terrestrial areas uh, that are either close to uh, the, sh the shore line or uh, lie at an elevation close to the shoreline, so they're wet. And the, sh the shore zone is, is, is ecologically highly varied. I've, I've um, shown you three pictures. These are all different kinds of shore zones. And there's a whole bunch more that you'll see in the course of the talk. So shore zones include, uh, you know, wooded swamps and, and beaches and, and submerged plant beds and, and all manners of, 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 of ecosystems. The shore zone is worth considering because it's very valuable to both ecosystems and to people. So let me give you a few examples of the value of shore zones. The, 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 from the ecological side, uh, shore zones are, are valuable because they're essential habitat for so many species. Some of these species live in the water, like the species that I've, um, that I've pictured here, fish and in, aquatic invertebrates and aquatic plants. Almost always, the number of species in a lake is highest near the shore and, and, and drops as you go into deeper water. And often the number of individuals, the population densities, are higher near the shore than in deeper water. There are also a whole bunch of species on the land side of the shore zone. And again, this is a very biologically rich area. And there are a bunch of species like the button bush in the lower right that are very typical inhabitants of, uh, of shore zones. And then there are other species like the yellow warbler in the upper right uh, that or the bat that forage, foraging here that that just like to live in shore zones because there's a lot of cover and a lot of things for them to eat. And there's a whole bunch of other species that it would be hard to categorize as either terrestrial or aquatic that live in shore zones. So uh, they, they may spend part of their life cycle in the water and part up on the land like the damselfly in the pictured in the lower right. It's Larvae live in the water and the adults live up on the, in the air where we can see them. And then there are other species that just, just move without any care between the land and the water. So this picture shows uh, some turtles and a great blue heron. And at the time the picture is taken, I guess their feet are dry. So they're up on the land. And you know, a minute after the picture is taken, they could easily be in the water. So there's, there's just very, very many species that live either exclusively in the shore zone or visit and value the shore zone part of, when, during part of their lives. There are also, um, shore zones are also hotspots for ecological activities. And let me just give you a few examples of the kind of activities I'm thinking of. The first is primary production is often very high in shore zones. This picture in the middle here just shows these very happy plants living in a shore zone. There's, there's plenty of water, obviously, there's lots of sunshine and there's often a lot of nutrients. So the rates of photosynthesis in shore zones are often very high. Um, in the upper right, there's a picture of what's called rack. I'll use this term uh, 
several times during the talk here. Wrack is uh, plant material that's washed up on the shore. And you can see a, a little bit of rack that's washed up on a, a sandy beach here. I think you can even see a bird there. The reason the, the birds are there is that when the rack lands up on the shore like this, as it is decomposing, there are a lot of tasty little invertebrates living in that rack. And so things like sandpipers walk up and down the beach looking for, um, for things to eat in the rack. And then finally, the picture in the, in the lower left shores, shows a forested shore zone along a river in this case, not a lake. But these riparian zones, these uh, near shore vegetation areas often are very effective at capturing pollutants as they wash off the land and keeping them out of rivers and lakes. So in this case, you see a, a largely agricultural landscape, a lot of row crops, and the fertilizer that supplies to those fields, a lot of that fertilizer will be captured and trapped in that shore zone and kept out of rivers and lakes. So shore zones are hotspots for ecological activity. I think I'm gonna skip this and uh, move on to my next the slide. Shore zones also are important travel corridors, highways for the movement of plants and animals. Uh, this uh, obviously is a high altitude photograph of the Finger Lakes area. And you know the Finger Lakes are, many of them are oriented sort of north-south. And you also know, I expect a lot of you, that there's a lot of movement of things like migratory birds north and south along the shores of these lakes. So the shores of uh, lakes and rivers are highways for the movement of, uh, of, of terrestrial animals on the land side. And they're also corridors for movement of aquatic animals, fishes and other aquatic animals on the wet side of the shore zone. And then uh, shore zones, as we move towards more human uses of shore zone or human values of shore zones, shore zones can protect valuable infrastructure that's up on the land. And so uh, I expect many of you know this, that intact floodplains can reduce the power and height of floodwaters and protect uh, valuable infrastructure up on the land. The pictures in the, in the bottom show also that, that the vegetation and other structures in shore zones can prevent erosion of the land by waves and by uh, ice push in the wintertime. And uh, if the shore zone is intact and there's a lot of vegetation there to protect the shore, uh, it can be subject to a lot less erosion than a bare uh, shore zone would be, would, would be. I'm gonna talk just very briefly about why shore zones are, are valuable to people. I expect most of you already know this because you probably spend time in shore zones yourself. So shore zones are, are, are really valuable to people as sites for recreation. And so people bird watch along the shore, they fish, they swim, they kayak and, and boat along the shore. And the, this painting in the lower right, this fellow in the painting, is just sitting there and looking at the, in the, at the water. And there, there's, when, I, when I'm out working on, uh, on lakes and rivers, I, I can't believe how many people I see that are just enjoying sitting and contemplating on the, on, sitting on the land, looking at the water. So there's all kinds of recreational use of, of both the land and water side of shore zones. Uh, an attractive shore zone can, can enhance property values. And th I, th this obviously is, is a well-known thing. We had a, an economic study here where I live in Southern Michigan uh, in the Huron River watershed that estimated from actual uh, house sales, recent house sales that having uh, live, having a view of the water, just a view of the water, increase the property value by about 50%. So if you have an attractive shore zone, your property can nearby can be worth more. If you have a really ugly shore zone, not so much. And then finally, there are a whole bunch of, of businesses that depend on the shore zone. So the mar marina in the, in the, on the left here, I mean, I don't see how you could have a marina that will, it wasn't in the shore zone. And that's what we call a water dependent business. It, 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 has, to be, uh, it has to be on the water. And same thing with the kayak rental place in the, in the upper right here. And then there are a whole bunch of businesses that you might call water enhanced, uh, things like restaurants, 
that are uh, that are along the shore, and they get more business, presumably because their customers like to to sit out on the deck and and look at the water while they enjoy a meal. So shore zones are are valuable both to uh, people and to nature. In fact, they're one of the most valuable parts of the of of the landscape. Now, uh, I want to transition to my next topic. Uh, I want to talk briefly about how humans have altered shore zones. So I've just told you how valuable shore zones are to people. And we've done a, a ton of things to shore zones to make them more useful to, to, to us in some, in some way. So a lot of people live in and near shore zones. I, I, I don't know exactly what the statistic means, but I uh, ran across a reference that said half of the world's populations lives in or near shore zones. I think this means like within 20 miles or something like that. But certainly many of the world's great cities, most of the world's great cities are in shore zones. Um, and, and there are a lot of other population centers uh, that are in or near shore zones. People use shore zones for all kinds of things and have for, for millennia. We build our houses there. A lot of times the richest agricultural soils are, are in shore zones and so we farm them. Uh, we use the, 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 the shore zone for shipping, uh, for ports, for manufacturing, for drawing water for municipal and industrial and, and agricultural use. We dispose of our sewage in the shore zone. There are just a hundred things that we use shore zones for. We, as a result, we've really changed the character of, of, uh, of, of many of our shore zones. As part of the work we did along the Hudson, we did a survey to see whether the shore zones were in what we call natural uh, condition, more or less, or whether they'd been obviously engineered. That is, if you were sitting in a boat uh, looking at the shore, did you see uh, evidence of human engineering in the form of uh, uh, bulkheads or pilings or uh, riprap, uh, revetments, things like that? And we concluded that about half of the of the length of the shoreline in the Hudson's been obviously engineered. And this is very typical of, of, of shore zones in, in developed parts of the world. I, I don't know what the number would be for the Finger Lakes, but certainly uh, if you were to cruise up and down the Finger Lakes, you'd see an awful lot of modified or engineered shorelines. In the past, this engineering was often done without considering ecological consequences. Somebody wanted to build a boat landing, they built a boat landing. Somebody wanted to build a marina, they built a marina, or they built a uh, retaining wall or a, a, a dock or whatever it is they were gonna build. They were concerned only with the human uses. In the last few years, this has begun to change and people have realized that some of the human uses of shore zones have caused very large ecological damage. And, and maybe more interesting, a lot of that damage really wasn't necessary, that we could get some of the human uses that we want and retain some of the ecological values as well. And so, at least in New York State and many other parts of the world now, if you're thinking about development in and along the shore, there's uh, regulations and permitting that are designed to help preserve some of the ecological function of the shore zone while letting you get the human uses that you want as well. So there, there have been just a whole bunch of human impacts on shore zones. I'm gonna show you, walk through some of these pictures just to show you uh, examples of the, some of the most typical things that, uh, that people have done with shorelines. So I'm gonna start in the upper left and see if I can work which way is that? Counterclockwise, I think. So uh, in the upper left, people have done an, a, a lot of what I would call hardening, narrowing, and steepening of shorelines. So the picture shows a sheet pile bulkhead, right? It's a vertical wall that people put there. This shoreline would have been sloping from the upland gradually into the intertidal zone and into shallow water. And so that you would have had a, a shore zone that might have been uh, maybe 100 feet wide, something like that. 
And what you have now is a shore zone that's essentially disappeared. There is no width to the shore zone. It goes right from like five feet above the water level to 10 feet de water depth right off the shore. So they've uh, narrowed the shore zone. They've uh, they've replaced what would have been sand or gravel or, or rock with steel, which counts as hardening and uh, and steep and it's vertical now the shore is vertical there and that that sort of thing uh, is, is 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 very common uh, all over the world then there's a whole class of impacts that i'm calling tidying um we we shore zones natural shore zones often are, are kind of messy and we want them to look more like our living rooms and so we tidy them up so you have a in the picture here people are grooming this beach and you can see that what happened in the last few days is some of this rack washed up on the beach and the uh, the managers of the beach or the owners of the beach don't want that. It's unsightly. And so they come by and they rake the beach and clean up this rack. And it does make the beach tidier. Uh, but however, it removes all that stuff that's feeding the shorebirds, right? And so it has some uh, ecological uh, costs. There's a, a lot of just general overuse of, of shore zones in some areas. You can see pictures like uh, scenes like this along shore zones where there's just a ton of people using them. And uh, this, this can uh, chase away wildlife and it can also cause erosion and things like that. There's a lot of building in the shore zone. Sometimes this building is, is, is water dependent uses like this marina here on the left. As I said, you can't really put a marina somewhere else. But then there's a lot of other, like a parking lot here. I'm not sure you really need a parking lot that close to the water. Um, and so we've done a lot of building in shore zones that's eaten up a lot of the valuable ecological habitat. There've been a lot of species introductions, sometimes of problematic species like this is Phragmites here in shore zones, which, uh, both on the uh, water and land side, we have a lot of plants and animals that are not native. Uh, in shore zones, and sometimes they cause ecological and economic problems. In the upper right, pollution. Uh, shore zones are especially prone to pollution by uh, stuff that floats, right? And so in this picture, you see a lot of plastic. There's, there's a lot of plastic accumulates along shore zones, but also things like oil uh, pollutants that, that, that float end up on, on shore zones. Uh, another class of impacts that's real common are stabilizing, shortening, and simplifying. So stabilizing, it's inconvenient for us if shorelines move around. Uh, you know, you build your house there, you don't want the shoreline to move 50 feet closer to your house and endanger the, the house. And so we tend to, to, to try to stabilize them and have them stay put. And we also shorten and simplify them. So this is a really nice a set of maps here. The left side is the Hudson River near Albany in 1820. And the right side is present day. And uh, the red in this is dry land. The yellow is intertidal zone. So this is wet in high tide and dry at low tide. The light blue is less than six feet deep at low tide. And the dark blue is more than six feet deep. And, and so in its original state, this was ecologically very rich. The Hudson River was very rich complex of habitats. It was inconvenient to say the least for navigation. This is near where Henry Hudson grounded his, his ship. And you can imagine that if you were trying to get up to the Port of Albany through this, this is nothing but a headache. And so what they've done, what people have done, and not just in the Hudson, but a lot of places, is you fill the marshy areas, you dredge the shallow water areas, and now you have a nice deep channel for shipping, you have nice dry land that you can put houses or factories or whatever on. Uh, unfortunately, you've destroyed a lot of the most valuable habitats uh, that were in that, that stretch of river. And this again happens all over the place. And then um, we've also increased uh, uh, wakes onto shores, which leads to erosion, especially on smaller lakes where, where uh, wave natural wave activity isn't that great that these uh, Powerboat wakes can uh, can cause a lot of erosion along shorelines, and then finally, I don't have a picture of this. We've changed water levels, um, either by stabilizing water levels because we don't want the, the river or the water to go up and down, 
or we'll do something like um, um, drop the water level during the winter to reduce ice damage to, to property. So lots of things that people have done uh, done in shore zones. Uh, again, because people weren't thinking about ecology when they were doing these things, a lot of times human uses have degraded ecological performance of shorelines. So the, that uh, the, the, the shorelines that people have worked on uh, have lower ecological performance than the natural ones. So uh, I'm sorry, I like graphs. All scientists like graphs. So I'm going to show you a graph. And uh, it's going to take me a minute to explain this. On the x-axis here, horizontally, are different ecological attributes, performances of shorelines, shore zones. So let's just look at this one here. This is plant cover. This is how many plants there are on the, this is on the land side of the shore zone. And um, the white symbols show natural shorelines. The gray symbols show uh, what we call built or engineered shorelines in the Hudson. The average value is, um, is, this, is this horizontal line here. And, uh, and the, the higher you are up here, the better for the performance. And the lower you are on the y-axis, the lower the performance. This is a steep logarithmic scale. So every tick is a tenfold increase or decrease in ecological performance. So in the case of plant cover, what you can see is on natural shorelines, there's an enormous range in plant cover. We have down here at the bottom, we have some natural shorelines that are uh, bare bedrock on the Hudson. And there's very few plants growing on those bedrock shorelines. Then we also have these very marshy shorelines that are just covered with plants, just tons of plants. And uh, so we have a wide range in how many plants there are on natural shorelines. We also have a wide range on the built or engineered shorelines in gray here, but you can see that the, the gray bar is shifted below uh, about a, maybe a threefold difference, shifted below the, the white bar. So there's fewer plants on the built shorelines than there are on the natural shorelines. And we can see this pattern with the gray bar doing being lower, doing more poorly than the white bar for most of the things that we measured about the ecology of Hudson River shorelines. The two obvious uh, exceptions here are non-native plant richness, where there's actually more non-native plants, including some invasive species, on the engineered shorelines than there are on the, on the natural shorelines. And the number of invertebrate animals is about the same on the two classes of shorelines. You might say, that, well, that's, we're doing pretty well with the, with the engineered ones. But if you look at who this is, on the natural shorelines, these are mostly native invertebrates. On the gray uh, built engineered shorelines, an awful lot of these invertebrates are zebra mussels, which most people think are not great things. So uh, in the Hudson and in shorelines around the world as well, generally the, the human engineered shorelines do more poorly as far as the ecology is concerned than the natural shorelines. And, um, I, and again, I would say this is largely because in the past, we haven't worried about trying to optimize ecological performance at the same time we're trying to, you know, build a marina or build a retaining wall or something like that. So the good news from the bad news that I just presented is that we have great opportunities to improve the ecological performance of shorelines. If we start considering ecological performance as well as engineering performance, we actually can do better than we have in the past. So uh, at, at, at the risk of overgeneralizing, some things that often improve the ecological performance of shore zones, and this is, uh, um, this is experience we've gotten from the Hudson, but also uh, re we reviewed the scientific literature from all over the world. And these things often perform uh, improve ecological performance. And I have an asterisk here. 
if you're interested in a particular ecological variable, you uh, th th these may not apply. So um, if you're interested particularly in, I don't know, the nesting habitat for the prothonotary warbler, the, then th there may be something other than what's on this list uh, that, that's important to that warbler species. But if we're thinking about ecology in general, these are the things that are usually good things. High physical complexity, lots of vegetation on both the land and water side. So both aquatic plants, submerged plants and trees and shrubs and things up on the land. A predominance of native species, especially native plant species. A broad width and mild slopes usually do better than narrow steep shorelines. At least some accumulation of rack and logs along the shore instead of the super tidy shore, shore zones. Uh, an absence of barriers to movement of, pl for, of plants and animals. And I'll show you what I mean in a minute by that. Natural variation or more nearly natural variation in water levels and low pollution from nutrients and, and, and poisons. So um, this list of features explains pretty readily why a uh, vertical steel shoreline does so poorly, right? I mean, this is steep, uh, it's narrow, it's not physically complex, it's not a natural material, there's no vegetation there. Uh, you know, it scores low in just about everything that I just uh, that I just enumerated, and so uh, that's why these vertical walls in the, in the Hudson. This is a steel sheet pile. This is timber cribbing. This this was used to make walls back in the 19th century. Uh, these tend to do very poorly on all aspects of ecology. They're they're poor fish habitat. They're poor for invertebrates. They're they, you know they're just crummy for a lot of uh, different ecological processes. The list that I gave you also immediately suggests a list of uh, recommendations for improving the performance of, uh, of shore zones, which is you know, to preserve or enhance physical complexity, to protect or enhance biodiversity, especially native species. Don't, to, don't squeeze the shore zone out of existence by making it vertical. If you can resist resist tidiness, uh, don't put up barriers in the shoreline. Mimic fit natural physical conditions uh, and prevent pollution. And I want to be a little more specific about about these general recommendations about what uh, what opportunities you might have for improving the ecological performance of shore zone. And so. The rest of the talk, I'm just going to go through mostly a series of pictures showing you specifically some ways that you might improve the ecological performance of shorelines, shore zones, while still retaining some of the human uses that you're interested in. And I want to make two general points before I go through this list. The first is I hope I will impress you that there are just lots of choices, dozens and dozens of choices for enhancing ecological performance of shore zones. It isn't like, oh, well, you know, we need to, uh, well, it, we, 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 have, we have lots of choices. And I wanna also stress that not every solution will work for every situation. So there are cases like with a marina, for example, where you may need to put in a vertical sheet pile, steel sheet pile wall. So, you know, the, the solution of replacing vertical sh sheet pile with something like this shore zone in the left is not going to work for a marina. But we have lots and lots of opportunities um, that can be used in different kinds of situations. So let's let's just look at, 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 at some of these opportunities. So if we're talking about uh, increasing or preserving physical complexity, one easy thing you can do is don't grade evenly uh, when you're uh, working on a site. There's an almost, I think, instinctive uh, reaction among, uh, among people when they develop a site is to, is to make the grade very even. And sometimes you need to do that. If this is gonna be a ball field or even a little bocce court or something like that, you don't want it super lumpy. 
But in a lot of cases, if this is just going to be parkland that people are going to are going to uh, sit by the river and maybe have a picnic or something like that, it doesn't have to be dead flat like a billiard table. So here's a this is uh, one shoreline that's being developed with very low physical complexity along the Hudson shoreline. This is another one on the right that was recently developed. It's just a few years ago. And here they graded very unevenly. So you see in the foreground, I'm standing on a path in the foreground, then, then it's graded to allow a little pond or swale here. And then it rises up, there's another path on this side. And then there's a little bit of a berm beyond that. And then we have some vegetation and then the Hudson River is beyond that. And you know, I think it's it's really easy to see that the site on the right is way more attractive to um, to to you know birds and wildlife and invertebrates and plants. There's a lot more habitats here. This also the site on the right also retains stormwater a lot better than the one on the left. And so there are a lot of advantages to grading unevenly if it doesn't conflict with what you're trying, what else you're trying to do with the site. Another way to preserve or enhance physical complexity is to use rough and mixed materials for shore defenses. So uh, again, here's a, an old wall along the Hudson River. It's smooth poured concrete. Uh, this, there's, there's really no habitat here for, uh, well, zebra mussels might like this fine, but you know, fish and other invertebrates uh, are, are not gonna find much to do on this, on this wall here. Here's a, also a defended shore along the Hudson that was built, but this is built with large stones and you can see there's small stone uh, in, in between it. And there's a, a, this is also a protected and stable shoreline, but it offers a lot better habitat than this smooth poured concrete does on the, on the left. Another way to enhance physical complexity is you instead of making a dead straight shoreline like this one back here, uh, you can try to make them little pockets or curves in the shoreline if it's practical to do so. So we got a little cove that they built here that provides a little sheltered area for uh, for animals. Um, I said that uh, having a lot of native uh, vegetation is good for ecological performance. So uh, you can try when you're building out a shoreline, you can try to include a lot of vegetation both on the land and water side. Here's one where they didn't take uh, advantage of that opportunity. Uh, this is a rip wrapped shoreline here. They made a half hearted attempt to plant a few shrubs, I don't know, every 10 feet, uh, 20 feet. And I believe this is a non native species. I don't remember for sure, but I think this was a non native species they used here. Compared to this is another, this is a planted shoreline on the right, a built shoreline. And you can see they have lots of vegetation here. It's fully vegetated instead of this barren shoreline on the left. And there's lots of species here, lots of cover for, uh, and food and so forth for, for animals. Uh, you can also plant native species. And, uh, and there, there are a lot of uh, native species that are becoming increasingly available in the nursery trade. Uh, for use here. So instead of planting uh, traditional non-native uh, uh, trees and shrubs and, and herbs that 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 don't offer uh, food for, for for native species, uh, we have uh, we have uh, plants like this is a nine bark shrub, sneezeweed. I love sneezeweed. It grows. Uh, it, it it it's called sneezeweed not because of hay fever, but because. Uh, it was used as snuff in the old days. So sneezeweed is a is a pretty uh, shoreline plant, and and vervain. There's 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 dozens and dozens of native plants that'll do real well in the shore zone and and uh, provide benefits, ecological benefits. Um, I said that people tend to narrow the shore zone. I keep showing you a picture of the shore zone. This is like the lowest ecological value of any shoreline you could imagine. Um, and uh, obviously, if you can retain instead of having a steep shore zone here uh, having one that's that's that with a lot of area near the elevation of the water surface there's a lot more ecological value in the shore on the right than there is on the left the shore on the right is not compatible with all uses right this would be a terrible thing to try to put a marina in uh, if 
th this guy here's got a, a, a boat dock here. If this boat dock is really essential, then uh, then this shoreline on the right is is no good. But in many cases, you do have an opportunity uh, to build a more uh, mild slope to a shoreline or retain a more mild slope to the shoreline. In fact, if if you are sometimes uh, there'll be an artificially steepened shoreline like this one on the left. And there's if you're going to be redeveloping this site for some reason or restoring it or rebuilding it, sometimes there's opportunities to regrade to reduce this steepness. And that they're doing that on this site where they're trying to cut back on the shoreline and restore a more natural uh, a grade to the shoreline. Uh, tidiness. Uh, you, you can probably imagine I'm not a very, I'm a, a kind of a sloppy person, I guess, but uh, if you can resist tidiness, uh, you can provide better ecological value. So one thing you can do is not mow right to the water's edge everywhere. This is a park here on the left where they mow right down to the water's edge. And uh, you can see several problems with this, that uh, there, there's no habitat. If you're a migrating warbler working along this shoreline as you move north, this is not a real great habitat for you. In fact, it's not a very good habitat for, 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 for much in the way of plants and animals, except it, it's actually these, uh, the, when you mow right down to the water's edge like this, this makes it really easy for the Canada geese to come up and poop on the lawn. And, and if, if I had a, a better picture of this lawn, you'd see it's full of goose poop. So, um, and then you also can see that this grass does not provide um, protection against erosion. And so they're trying to prevent erosion by putting a little stone here on, on the shore. But when the water gets above that stone, you can see that it's eating away and eroding at this, uh, at this grassy uh, lawn. Contrast this with a, with a site like on the right where they've, they've, they've allowed access, visual access and physical access to the water here in a few places. So it's open. You can get down to the water here if you want. But they've also left a lot of native vegetation. This protects the shoreline from erosion. It provides habitat for, for uh, animals. And it also keeps the geese off the uplands a little bit. Uh, another way that uh, if you can uh, resist tidiness is uh, if you leave some driftwood and rack along the shore, that provides habitat and food for the animals that live in the shore zone. So I know this doesn't look tidy to you, but the, offshore here you have habitat for baby fish and turtles and things. Uh, you've got perching and basking sites here for things like herons. Um, and there's there's a lot more ecological value here than there is to a tidy shoreline. So if you want to have a nice little neat spot where you can sit, that's fine. But if there are other places where you can can leave the shoreline in a little more natural state, that's that's great. Um, I said uh, vegetation is your friend as far as ecological value. This is the same park I showed you a minute ago. Uh, they have vast areas where it's just it's just grass. And again, sometimes you, you might need this if this was a ball field, you don't want to have you know, shrubs out behind the shortstop. But in a lot of cases, uh, the, the, you don't actually need all this this lawn. So you can, this again on the right is a, is a constructed planted shoreline along the Hudson. And uh, they've allowed uh, access to the site with paths and things like that. But they've also planted a lot of, uh, a lot of shrubs in here to provide some, some cover for the, for the animals. And, and and I think it's attractive. Um, I, I, I told you shorelines are uh, important migration corridors, movement corridors for animals. When you build a wall, you prevent that uh, movement. So you can just imagine some poor turtle, some poor, poor female turtle in the springtime trying to get up to lay her eggs on the shore here. There's no way she's gonna get up this, this wall onto the shoreline. So uh, th this is, uh, these vertical walls are problems in a, in a lot of ways, but one of them is they prevent uh, movement of animals. And even something like a curb here, 
this may look pretty innocuous, but to something uh, like a salamander that's moving around in the landscape, uh, this is, it may as well be the Great Wall of China. It's not gonna get over this, uh, this wall. So if you can avoid these, uh, these barriers, smooth vertical walls, uh, it's a good thing to, to avoid. Uh, an, another another thing that it's a problem for migrating animals. This is this again the site in Poughkeepsie I showed you before. It is long, long, long gap in the vegetation here, and so uh, again, if you have a, a migrating bird trying to mo move along the shoreline, it's really, really not a very hospitable habitat for that bird. And they could have they could have left a little more vegetation or planted a little more vegetation along the shore to to, to help with that. Um, it's important to try to prevent pollution in the shore zone. Uh, you know, the, the water is just right there. And so if you spray pesticides like this guy is uh, doing here or put a lot of, ro ro a lot of uh, road salt down on your walks or, 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 or roads in the shore zone or spread a lot of fertilizer in the shore zone, it washes right into the water. And uh, so to the extent that you can, uh, you know, it's useful to try to limit use of, uh, of these harmful substance, potentially harmful materials in the shore zone, uh, because they're gonna end up right in the, in, in the lake or the, or, or the river. And this applies as well to, to storing harmful materials in the shore zone. I don't know what's in this shed, but uh, you can imagine there might be sacks of fertilizer in here or cans of gasoline or things like that. And uh, that's fine until a, a, a storm blows this over, or or uh, the gas can leaks, or things like that. And 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 so uh, it's it's not it, it it's it's a good idea if you can avoid storing harmful materials in the shore zone as well. Uh, another thing, I don't have a good picture for this, but um, if you can avoid uh, polluting non-water dependent structures and uses in the shore zone. That's a good idea. Now, this this is the Hudson River and there probably isn't any realistic way we could have kept this rail line and this parking lot out of the shore zone. But sooner or later, there's gonna be a derailment on this ra rail line the way there was in Ohio a few weeks ago. And whatever is in that train car is gonna be in the Hudson River in about a minute and a quarter. And uh, and, and the same thing with this parking lot here, somebody's got a, a leaking oil, uh, it's gonna end up in, in the river. So when you're siting structures like this that can result in pollution, if you can keep them out of the shore zone, if, if you can, uh, then that's a, a, a good idea as well. And that applies to erosion of soil as well. Any soil that's eroded in the shore zone ends right up in the, in the river where it degrade, a river or the lake where it degrades habitat and harms fish spawning and things like that. So, open construction like this is a is a bad idea. This you know the minute we get a two and a quarter inch rain, this is going to all this muddy water is going to end up down in the in the, in the lake. Uh, if you have to do construction uh, in the shore zone, you know what they're trying to do here with the silt fence is keep keep runoff out of the Hudson River. Um, you can also sometimes put in things like rain gardens and swales in the shore zone to try to control the runoff that's generating erosion and causing problems. Um, I'm almost done here. Let me just, uh, so uh, I, I mentioned earlier that wakes can cause uh, the shorelines to erode. If you, if you can uh, reduce uh, wakes by having no wake zones near the shore or in enforcing them, that's a, that's a good idea. Uh, something a lot of people don't realize is that these vertical walls also reflect wave energy. And so if you had had a, a more sloping sandy beach here, for example, it would have absorbed that wave energy. What happens here when you put a vertical wall in, the waves come in, they crash against that wall, and they dig away, they erode away the shallow water sediments in front here uh, of the wall, deepening, you know, they deepen these near shore areas and eliminate the shallow water areas near the shore. They can also uh, cause erosion just beyond the ends of these, uh, ends of these vertical walls as well. 
So uh, if you can avoid shore defenses that reflect wave, waves, that's a, that's a good idea as well. And then I mentioned uh, overuse. Uh, people just love shore zones to death sometimes. And so um, it, you can either use signs and barriers or uh, paths and, and boardwalks and things like that to direct people to, where, to, to go where you want them to go in the shore zones and keep them out of the most, uh, the most sensitive areas. Uh, I already talked about vertical walls. If, you, if, you can, if you're trying to protect uh, shore, the land from erosion, uh, if you can go with something like this, this is, uh, this is riprap on a highly exposed shore that's protecting this road here beyond. This, this shore zone has much higher ecological value than this short zone does, the vertical sheet pile does. So a sloping defense is better than a vertical wall. Huh. And uh, if you can use natural materials, that's better for the ecology. It's also better for the aesthetics a lot of times. This is the single worst example I've ever seen of a shore defense. Uh, I, I've heard people call this Detroit riprap. Uh, you know, it, it's ugly, it, it's not ecologically uh, valuable. It's, it's just a terrible idea. Uh, and uh, I, I wanna, I, I, I see I'm running over time. So let me wrap this up. One other general point I wanna make is in addition to there being a lot of opportunities to improve the management of shore zones for ecological benefits, these improvements can occur at any stage in the process. So if you're in the early planning stages, thinking about doing something with the shorelines, you can start by including ecological goals along with engineering and cost goals to make sure they're included. So at the very earliest stages, you can start including ecological goals. If in construction, when if you're actually building out a site, you have opportunities to improve ecological performance. You can retrofit an existing site and make it more valuable ecologically. And if you're managing a site that you can't retrofit, there's still a bunch of things that you can do to improve ecological performance. So not only there are, are there a lot of opportunities to improve the ecological performance of shore zones, but you can do these things at all stages of the planning, construction, and management, uh, all stages of, of, of the, those processes. So um, if you're interested in further information, there's a lot of stuff out in the web right now. I do like the, the Hudson River Sustainable Shoreline site. Uh, it has a lot of information uh, that you might find valuable. It also includes some demonstration sites down on the Hudson. So if anybody wants to see what some of these techniques look like, uh, you know, pick a fine summer day and drive down to the Hudson and, and, and look at, the, at some of these uh, ecologically enhanced shorelines that are being built on the Hudson. And there are a couple good brochures that, uh, uh, places where you can start uh, uh, learning about ways to manage shorelines better. And uh, I'm sorry I ran a little bit long. I'd be happy to try to answer any questions at this point. Thank you for your patience. Yeah, that's okay. Thanks so much, Dave. Um, let me see if we have any questions. I saw one come in earlier. Um, are you aware of any research looking at the impact of the decline in insect populations on aquatic species? No, I, 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 I'm not. Uh, this is, uh, there, there are two, this is probably what the questioner has in mind, but there are a couple of uh, things that could be important here. The one is that a lot of aquatic species feed on terrestrial insects that fall into the water. Uh, in, in along the shore. I mean, you see this all the time. There are ants and honeybees and all kinds of things that fall in the water and they get scarfed up by the fish. The other side of it, uh, the reason there's a lot of bats in the shore zone and spiders and uh, insect, insectivorous birds is that a lot of the insects that emerge out of the lake or the river, the first thing they meet is a, is a, a predator waiting to eat them up, on, up in the shore zone. Great. Um, let's see here. Is there an appropriate management of driftwood for an oligotrophic lake like Skinny Atlas? 
We often have wood washed into the lake from firewood or other man-made sources rather than natural sources. Um, I, I'm not sure what you what you have in mind here. I'm not I'm not sure that you know if if the wood is not treated wood. I'm not sure that it matters to the ecological function of it whether it's natural or not. To you know, as long as there's not tons of it, uh, unnatural amounts of it, or something like that. But I'm not sure that uh, you know the if if the heron's standing on a piece of of firewood, I'm not sure it matters a lot that it's not natural. Gotcha. Um, can you talk actually a little bit? I know some people struggle with how much to clean up a shoreline when it's causing issues and when they should leave leave you know rack and some of the debris there um can you talk a little bit more about kind of what how people might be able to decide when when they need to remove things and when things maybe aren't a problem even though historically they've been thought of as a problem if that makes any sense yeah this is a hard problem this is getting into aesthetics as well as ecology and so I'm not going to lecture people about their aesthetics. So uh, the easy part of this is uh, I wouldn't have any trouble with taking tr plastic or trash or things like if I if I owned uh, lakeside property or something like that, cleaning that stuff up. Uh, I don't I don't see any issues with that. Um, I would and nor uh, with. Uh, something that's interfering with sort of an essential use of, of the site. So, um, you know, I've got a dock and it's in, in, in a high, in a storm or something like that, a whole bunch of rack gets thrown up on the dock and it makes it slippery and hard to walk on uh, or you're something like that, right? Beyond that, um, you know, the more you leave, the better the ecological value is going to be, I would say overgeneralizing. So some of this is, uh, so like those people on the beach that were cleaning the rack off the beach. I'm, I'm not sure that they really have to get all that rack off the beach to make it pleasant to, sw to swim in. Um, and maybe they could, could, uh, could uh, work out some some system where they cleaned off part of that beach for very fastidious people and left the rest of it for the sandpipers. Um, or maybe, the, and, and put up some brochures explaining they're sharing the beach with the sandpipers. Um, I, let me give you a, a, a story that might help. Right now, a lot of people think that if they leave any of that stuff on their property, it's it's uh, irresponsible and ugly and things like that. In Europe, they used to, in parts of Europe, and I think they still do, they rake the forest. So they rake, <laughs> the way you'd rake the lawn, rake your lawn in the fall, they rake the forest. And so they take all the leaves and all the twigs and everything out of the forest. And uh, I had a friend come over from Germany once and she, she couldn't believe how messy our forests were. It doesn't bother us that there are leaves on the forest floor in the fall, right? Or even a few twigs. I don't think it bothers us because that's the aesthetic we've come to um, come to be comfortable with. And, uh, and, 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 and and they're discovering in Europe now that there have all kinds of ecological problems from over tidy forests. Uh, that they're trying to rectify now. They're actually putting out dead wood and things like that in the forest to try to make up for all the dead wood they've removed over the past few centuries. So I'm wondering whether we need to change our sort of aesthetic that the, the shoreline doesn't have to look like your living room to be beautiful. But that's something you need to, to decide. I can't tell you what you think is beautiful. Yeah, I I agree. And so I'm hoping, I think a lot of folks in Skinny Atlas are interested in this too. And so um, in part three, we'll be talking kind of more about some of the techniques that people can do on their properties, especially in Skinny Atlas and the southern 
portion of the, the watershed, there are really, really steep slopes. I think folks struggle with how to protect their properties, you know, from, from erosion and from, you know, flooding and all of these issues, but, you know, also trying to maintain a, a more natural shoreline. So I know that's, that's an issue that we're hoping to tackle in, in session three. Um, are there any other questions? I'm not seeing anything in the Q and A. Real? Yeah, Janice. Janice. So I was just going to say that on one of the the, the slides that um, Dr. Strayer showed, it was a pretty erosive um, beach area that was grass, and it looked like um, it, it looked like it was there so that people could see the water, right? Well, but you could put native um, grasses and sedges and short native flowers in that in that whole area and people could still see it and you still have the ability to soak up, you know, make create a sponge for the water when it flows over into the into the lake. So just wanted to add that. Yeah, but, absolutely. Yes, that's a good point. I think I I think we sometimes I think they they're probably mowing that lawn because that's what they've always done, and and that's the default aesthetic again that it's a lawn, but you know you you could either do what you suggested, Janice, plant low growing plants there to provide a little more ecological value and resistance to erosion, or and or you could uh, have a series of viewpoints along that. Uh, viewing places along that shoreline, maybe a half a dozen places where you maybe even had a nice platform or a picnic table or something like that, where people could visit and look out over the water and and vegetate the rest of it, even with taller stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And I think a lot of what you're talking about and what we'll be kind of going through in this series is some of the cultural aspects of, of what shoreline types people have. And so I'm hoping to get into some of the social science in a future um, program as well. That's a topic that's very near and dear to my heart as a social scientist is, you know, where like educating people is, is great, but how do we kind of understand some of the, the barriers that folks are facing and some of the reasons why they might be making the decisions that they're making too. So um, stay tuned for all of that, everyone. But since we're at 803, if there's no other questions, um, I will just wrap this up and say a huge thank you to Dave for a great presentation um, all about the ecology side of shorelines. Um, thank you all for taking your time out of this um, evening to join us. Um, please don't forget to fill out our evaluation form and I will be sending an email along shortly with um, the evaluation link, recording link, and any other resources. I'll share Dave's slides and some of the other resources from Hudson River Sustainable Shorelines. Um, you know, they are written for the Hudson River, but I find them really, really helpful um, and pretty generalizable as well. Um, so yeah, thank you all so much for joining us tonight. And I have hope you have a great rest of your evening. Thank you. Thanks.